Let's pray. Lord, we, uh, we come to you on this very special day with a yearning to worship, to seek, to grow, and to discover you. And I pray, Lord, as we come into your presence as a church family, that you would manifest your presence. We know you're here. And we pray, Lord, that you would open the eyes of our hearts and our minds and our souls to the living God who walks among us and who's in this room today. That as we learn and as we discover you, through your word and through your presence and through the work of your spirit, that we would come to understand the depth of your grace and we would desire, Lord, to worship and honor and submit ourselves back to you during this time of worship. And Father, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for the work. We thank you for your son, especially, who's made all this happen. We thank you for your spirit, who is now moving amongst us. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our call to worship is from Revelation chapter 22, verses 12 through 17. The Word of God tells us, Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to render to every man according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes, so that they may have the right to the tree of life, and may enter by the gates into the city. Outside are the dogs, and the saucers, and the immoral persons, and the murderers, and the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices lying. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, Come. And let the one who hears say, Come. And let the one who is thirsty come, and let the one who wishes take the water of life without cost. And this morning, as we contemplate this wonderful invitation, we're going to open with a hymn. It's number 43. Uh, would you please stand with me, uh, if you can? And uh, the words will be right up here on the screen.
When one of those who were reclining at the table with him heard this, he said to him, Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. But he said to him, A man was giving a big dinner, and he invited many. And at the dinner hour he sent his slave to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is ready now. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first one said to him, I have bought a piece of land, and I need to go out and look at it. Please consider me excused. Another one said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm going to try them out. Please consider me excused. Another one said, I have married a wife, and for that reason, I cannot come. <laughs> And, and a slave came back and, and, and reported to his master. <laughs> then the head of the household came and became angry and said to his slave, Go out at once into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in here the poor and crippled and blind and lame. And the slave said, Master, what you commanded has been done, and still there is room. And the master said to the slave, Go out into the highways and along the hedges and compel them to come in so that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste my dinner. And God always has his blessing to the reading of his word. And you should be born creation.
Ephesians 2, 8 to 9 says, For by, by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. You alone are God. Oh 
It is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. Many of you have received invitations before. What, what type of invitations do we typically see circulating about in our culture today? If I were to ask you, yes. A wedding invitation, that's probably the most common one. We have wedding invitations. Uh, what other types of invitations do people send? Jonathan? Birthday. A birthday invitation, yes. We have birthday invitations. What other types of invitations do we see? Baby showers, yes, and, and, or wedding showers. Different types of showers, those are others. What, what other types of invitations? Sandy? I'm sorry? A dinner invitation, very good, yes. A graduation, yes. They're, they're coming up right around the corner soon, yes. A gender reveal party for grandparents. For grandparents, all right. All right, so we have an invitation. So uh, uh, so we, should we just extend congratulations now? Or, uh, yeah, okay. Awesome, yes. A bar mitzvah, yes. A bar mitzvah, a bat mitzvah, very good, yes. Daughters of the King, yes, church events. We have different things going on. You received actually a, a mountain of invitations this morning, uh, right as we went through the announcements. You know, we, we have exercise class, we invite you to that. Bible study, we invite you to that. Daughters of the King, you know, we have potluck, we, we invite people to stay for coffee hour. You know, there's all sorts of invitations that go out. And uh, an invitation consists what? Normally, there, there's what? A date, uh, there's a time. And then there's some form of a request made. Uh, going to the showers, we typically will bring something, or if it's a wedding, uh, we'll bring something along with us. If we're going to uh, a, uh, like a potluck, you bring your appetite. And all of God's people said amen to that. And so, so you sometimes bring something, and it gives you the specifics as to what's taking shape. One of the things that drives us crazy when it comes to invitations is what? Some people don't respond, even if you can't come. I mean, how many of you have planned out weddings and you send out like 50 or maybe 100 invitations and like three people respond and you feel like, you know, you get this big, what's going on? You know, maybe you don't have any friends or you discover you don't have any friends. But what happens with an invitation very often is we, there needs to be a response. And then you not only tell the person, yes, I'm going to show up, and, but you also have to follow through. And what we find is that in the story of Noah, over the last hundred plus years as Noah's been working on the ark, he has been extending what? An invitation. It tells us in scripture that Noah is a preacher of righteousness. And he is building this massive water going vessel that is capable of holding not just critters, but people as well. And he has been inviting people, he has been preaching, he has been imploring, he has been explaining what's going to happen, that God is going to do something very catastrophic. He's going to wipe out the earth, he's going to cleanse everything, but you could find refuge in the ark, you could find comfort in the ark, you can come to this thing called the ark, and, and everybody's looking around and they're seeing this monster ship out there that's being built, this huge wooden thing that they've never seen before, and they're all scratching their heads like, what's up with that? And we see here that in the Bible, this, this notion of invitation not only is echoed with Noah's ministry, but it's found throughout the entire corpus of the scriptures. And let's take a look here at Noah and an invitation that's made in a very subtle way in the first five verses of chapter 7. Then the Lord said to Noah, Enter the ark, you and your household, for you alone I have seen to be righteous before me in this time. You shall take with you of every clean animal by seven, a male and his female, and of the animals that are not clean, two, a male and his female. Also uh, of the birds of the sky by sevens, male and female, to keep offspring alive on the face of the earth. For after seven more days I will send rain on the earth, forty days and forty nights, and I will blot out from the face of the land every living thing that I have made. And Noah did according to all that the Lord had commanded him. And we'll stop right there. We have an invitation. We find here an illustration, and then we have the application for these five verses. It tells us here that Noah was found righteous in the eyes of God, which is sort of unusual because we see the entire world is corrupt, and Noah is standing out. 
Now Noah isn't a perfect person, but Noah is a person who is walking by faith, according to Hebrews. That he is living by faith. He is putting his faith into practice. He is illustrating that faith by virtue of the fact that he's been working on this ark for years. And he is obeying the voice of God, and he is following through with God's commandments. And Noah and his family are are involved with this enterprise, and no one is listening. And it's really quite sad, because he's out there telling people, and let's face it, you know, people are, are going about their business. You know, they're going to the market, they're going to the restaurants, they're hanging out the movies, they're seeing one another, they're interacting with one another, and now all of a sudden you've got this, this monstrosity of a structure being built that you can't miss. I mean, you want to talk about the elephant in the room, it is the, the ark. And all this time, God is imploring people to respond and to come. It tells us, depending on what translation uh, you read here, it says, uh, go into the ark or come into the ark. The, the King James actually is the closest to the Hebrew. And there's a, there's a key word in that opening verse, and that's the word bow. <laughs> Very simple. To come. Now if I say, go out into the parking lot, if I use the word go, which really doesn't give us a good picture, it's like, okay, I've got to go from here over to something else. But if I say to you right now, would you come to the stage? You're, you're, you're entering into another place where the person who is extending the command or the invitation is. And in Hebrew, when it says to come into the ark, it is a picture, a beautiful picture, of Noah and joining with God. And that invitation is reflected in passages throughout the rest of the Bible. We see it in Isaiah. Come now, let us reason together. Though your sins are like scarlet, they will be like snow. Though they are like crimson, they will be as white as wool. An invitation to come and find forgiveness. Jesus said, you know, come to me all you are, who are weary and heavy laden and what am I going to do? I'm going to give you rest. It tells us in the end of Revelation, what? The spirit and the bride say, what? Come. And find the water of life. And this invitation is not something where we're going out somewhere, but we're coming into a relationship with God. As Noah responds to God's word in faith, so must we respond to the invitation that God is sending to us in faith. Because the righteous must live by faith. It is not something that's blind. It's not something that you're just taking some jump off of a cliff here. We are responding in faith to God's specific words and invitation to us. And that really brings us to our first point, is that God invites people into fellowship with himself. He has been doing so since the beginning of time. He is extending this invitation to have fellowship with him, to enjoin with him, to have a relationship with him, and he desires and yearns for that, and he has been sending that invitation out through the gospel message, through his apostles, and through subsequent servants since the beginning of the church age. God invites people to a relationship with himself. The next we have here is this illustration of a response. But it's not the type of response we would expect. It's not the people. They're not jumping up and down over Noah's preaching. But we find here the manifest. The occupants of the ark, the critters, are all coming out. We have three groups of critters mentioned here in Genesis 7. We are introduced to those uh, that are clean, those that are not clean, and then the birds. Clean, unclean birds. The clean come in pairs of two, and there's apparently seven, seven pairs of each. The unclean are only going to be found uh, just two of each, and then we have this group of birds. And it's raised a lot of questions about, you know, were there going to be, uh, you know, seven, just actual seven, or is there going to be two couples? The, the language seems to imply that we're going to have couples, you know, seven couples coming in of the, the birds, seven of the clean animals, and then two of uh, those that are unclean. And uh, that actually gives us a picture here, really, of about how many occupants are going to be on the ark. If you look at the number of kinds that are out there, and you calculate that out based on the numbers given here, we're looking at an occupancy of about 6,700 animals. 
animals on the ark. Uh, give or take. Of course, Answers in Genesis has the details on this if you want to go to their website and, uh, and check it out. But we're looking at approximately 6,700 critters, 6,700. And the ark is capable of holding literally over 100,000 sheep. So it is not filled to capacity, which means there's going to be lots of room for food and for water, uh, which really brings us to the logistics as to how this whole thing worked out. How in the world, with all of these occupants on the manifest, did this small family have the capacity to take care of them? Well, the food issue is, is moderately easy to, to figure through because almost everything on this planet will eat like non-meat. <laughs> if you're hungry enough, and sometimes we're hungry enough, you'll eat anything. And Noah has been storing food in the ark for quite some time and has the supplies and definitely the room to hold the supplies uh, for the animals. So uh, when you think about it, you know, when, when people are, are, are in dire straits, I mean, they'll, they'll go out and they'll eat bark. And, and, and it'll sustain you for a while. So if you're in a, a tight situation, uh, you don't necessarily have to have a cheeseburger in order to get through the day, okay? And, and we find that here. So the food is being stored. Uh, there's, there's going to be enough room to store uh, the, the grains and the like, uh, the hay and the supplies that they need. Uh, water is not going to be a problem because, let's face it, the earth is going to be like a full of quite a bit of that. And uh, they've, they've actually done some simulations and found that the roof design of the ark, the way it's constructed, is that you could, you could channel water in uh, to like these giant pots inside the ark uh, through a very simple drainage system so there's ample water for the animals. But what's unique about what happens here, and this is why I believe it was very feasible for Noah's ark uh, to exist the way it's described with the numbers that are described here and that life could be sustained on the ark, is that when there is radical temperature changes, something happens to, to, to living creatures. We slow down. And one of the great hypotheses, which I believe is true, is that because of the great flood and the storms, there was a massive atmospheric change due to the weather. And when that occurs, there's a natural mechanism in just about every living creature to go to sleep. You've experienced it. You probably have. When we lived down in Texas, it would be like 105 degrees. I'd come home from church, it would be Sunday afternoon, and my wife would be like, Dave, what are you doing? Nothing. I am doing nothing at all. I am not going out and mowing the lawn. I'm not doing anything with shrubs. I'm certainly not going on the roof. I am doing nothing. And I'd sit on the couch and do nothing. Why? Because it's so hot. My body is, and your bodies have done this too. Now, some of you, it could only be 70 degrees, and you're going, I'm doing nothing. You know? <laughs> but, you know. We have another, we, we have some proverbs for that, okay? And that, that's called, you know, the sluggard and the, you know. But, but when, when you have extreme temperature changes, and, and we see it even now. I mean, we, we live here in, in practically Siberia. When was the last time you saw a woodchuck running around in the middle of the winter? What are they doing? Nothing. Why? Because the temperature changes, brings their metabolism, slows it down, and they go into a hibernative state. Bears do that. Deer do it. A lot of critters do this. They, it's built right in. <clears throat> So what I believe happened here, and one of the reasons why Noah and his family were able to sustain uh, the occupancy, the manifest of the ark, is that there was probably a very, like a semi-hibernative state that these animals went into, thus not consuming as much, not being as active, sleeping a bit more, and keeping it extremely manageable. But there's something else we need to take a look at here when it comes to the manifest. And that is the occupants here are divided into these groups. And that's a, a little different. This is the first time in the Bible we see this idea of a clean animal and an unclean animal. Now why in the world would they be clean and unclean? And that distinction is not given in terms of which specific animals did Noah deem clean and unclean, or did God deem clean and unclean to Noah. But we find out later in Leviticus when God begins to formulate the nation of Israel and he issues the Ten Commandments and he sends Moses and uh, Aaron and, and the like to convey uh, God's word to his people, they're going to be allowed to uh, consume certain animals and then there's others they're not going to be allowed to eat. 
Uh, they're going to be, you know, told to sacrifice a very specific group, and then there's going to be many that they won't bring to, to temple worship and sacrifice. And we see that there's this distinction between clean and unclean animals, and it's and it's expanded upon in the book of Leviticus that you shall touch what no unclean thing. You'll so you should be separated. And there's this idea of separation that starts with the Ark account, and then it is built upon throughout the entire course of the Mosaic Covenant and all that Moses is going to learn about, that there needs to be the sense of separation. They, they couldn't, like their, their clothing, they couldn't like mix you know, like wool and cotton together. Everything had to be separate. They, when you had a plate of food, you couldn't like mash all your stuff together like a shepherd's pie. You had to put it all apart in different sections of the plate. Everything needed to be separate including how they interacted with the animals. And that's, that's a, a, a critical point that we need to extrapolate from the text here, and that is, is that God was conveying a powerful motif that's going to start here in Genesis, and it's going to run all the way through the rest of the Bible, and that is distinction, separation, holiness. That we find here the beginning of God conveying to his people the call to be holy. Pure heart, mind, soul, attitude, actions, words. The scripture says be holy because God is holy. And that he is calling a people to be separate and distinct and different, apart from the world. Live in the world, yes, we must, but to not take on the attributes of the world, the lust of the eyes, selfishness, immorality, greed. These are things that we must separate ourselves from. And what we find here in the scriptures is this call to be holy, to be unique, to be distinct from that of the world. Because in doing so, we begin to fulfill our God-given purpose, which is to reflect Him and to glorify Him. And if the world is going to understand anything about the God of the universe, and His attributes and His character, His love and His compassion, His grace and above all His holiness, we are called to resemble that in how we think, and how we behave, in what we believe, and how we interact with one another. I knew of a man years ago who was on the cusp of becoming a professional baseball player. He ended up with an injury, so he, he did not go into the major leagues, but he was just that good. I never saw the man play baseball in my life. I never had an opportunity to see him on the field, catch the ball, throw a ball, hit the ball, never. But I knew he was good because I saw his son. And his son stood head and shoulders above any other kid out there on that baseball field. That boy had a rocket of an arm. He knew exactly how to throw a ball. He knew how to slide. He knew how to hit. He knew everything about the game inside out and backwards. He was a superlative baseball player because he reflected his father. And I understood something about the father by virtue of seeing the son and his ability on the field. And that is the holiness that God is calling us to. To reflect him in such a way that when people see a follower of Jesus Christ, they're going to see Christ himself shining through a human being. So what we find here is that the invitation that is being extended is an invitation to a relationship, but it's an invitation to a relationship that entails walking in holiness, being distinct, being separate, being pure, being unique. The third piece we see here is the application. We have the invitation, we have this illustration of holiness, and the application really comes at the very last piece when it says that once again Noah did everything God commanded him to do. He obeyed God in full. He put his faith into practice and he lived it out. 
and he followed through with the gathering of the grains, he followed through with the construction of the ark. One of the unique things here is he didn't have to go out chasing after the critters. Did you notice that? The critters came to him. So it wasn't like they were sitting around and Noah was looking at his boy and says, wait a minute, wait a minute, we're missing a couple of yaks. Go out there and find me a yak or two or a kudu or, you know, they didn't have to go down to a local pond and, and dig out a hippo because they were short of hippos that day. I mean, everything came to Noah. They were being drawn to the ark. Now I want you to think about that for a minute. What a witness. Here you got this monstrous ark. Noah's out there preaching like crazy. He's telling us, God is going to be faithful. He's going to destroy the earth. You've got you to get on board. There's room for you here. You're, this, is, this invitation has been echoing over and over and over again. And all of a sudden you see those critters showing up. Could you imagine? You know, you're out in your garden. And you see a bunch of gazelles jumping through. And then you see the woodchucks. And the bunny rabbits. And, and all these critters. And they're all going to the ark. <coughs> you're saying, wait a minute. Noah's inviting us to the ark. And they're the ones showing up. How does this work? And it's this tremendous testimony that is being illustrated here that through his obedience, God is blessing and he is bringing forth this select group of animals that are going to be saved. And against the contrast of all that, we have a group of people that are just like those in the parable we read a few moments ago who are sitting around making excuses. Well, we never got on a boat before. We never saw rain. <laughs> How do we know this is true? How do we know this is going to happen? And you can see the excuses flowing. I bet you they probably made fun of Noah. They probably, I, 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 this is Dave going out on a limb, but I, I bet you they picked on him a little bit. You know, what are you doing with all your time? How do you know God even spoke to you about this? And the excuses flew. You think about the banquet for a little bit, and uh, those excuses, you know, fields and oxen and getting married and all, you know, that's us. God's inviting people into a relationship with himself. He's inviting people to a life of holiness, to walk with Christ and to develop intimacy with Christ and to obey Christ and to serve Christ and to be enjoined with Christ. I mean, this is a picture of what the, the church is about. And what we find here is that we're just like those people out there watching all the critters coming by and we're making those same lame excuses. And at the heart and soul of it all, it's this thing called, called human pride. We don't think we need to respond to the invitation that God has been sending to us. And that's the tragedy of humanity. I could do it on my own. I've got a better plan. I don't need to serve. I don't need to obey. I don't need to do these things because I've got it together. Years ago, in the University of Edinburgh, in the uh, theology school, there was a professor by the name of Dr. John Duncan. And Duncan was known all over Europe as being one of the preliminary Hebraicists. He was a teacher of Hebrew at this exclusive university. He not only spoke Hebrew beautifully and eloquently and taught it to his students, he knew, he knew Ugaritic and Sanskrit and uh, Aramaic and, and was just so well versed in the Semitic languages. In fact, he was so popular and so good at his job that they didn't call him Professor Duncan, they referred to him as Rabbi Duncan. And there became a joke going around the students in the school that old Rabbi Duncan probably prayed in Hebrew. He didn't pray in English. He would go and sit down at night and have his devotions in, in the Hebrew language. So they, they kept on talking about, well, perhaps he does. And, well, maybe he doesn't. And this, this, this bantering went back and forth, and the debate raged a little bit around the lunch table. So finally, a couple of students said, well, we're going to find out. Now, back then, the professors actually lived on campus. They had apartments and dorm rooms and the like, so they were very accessible. So one night, two students under the cover of darkness, decided to sneak up to Dr. Duncan's room and see if they could hear him pray. And sure enough, they creep down the hall and his door was open just a little bit. They look into his room and there he is, sitting in his chair reading his Bible. 
He closes the Bible. He puts it on his shelf. He goes to his bed. He kneels down. And he closes his eyes. And he shocks them. And he says this. Gentle Jesus. Meek and mild. Come to me. Your little child. That was his prayer. The Bible tells us that unless we come and become like little children, we can never enter the kingdom of God. <coughs> Think about that. To quote the verse fully, unless we change and become like little children, we can never enter the kingdom of God. For whoever humbles himself like a child will be considered great in the kingdom of God. And right there, we identify humanity's greatest stumbling block as to why we don't respond to the invitation to know Christ and to grow in Christ. It's human pride. Years ago, I was working in a nursery down in Texas. We had nursery duty, and there was this little boy running around. He was probably two and a half, and, and he was just, he, he was a dynamo. I mean, you've, you've seen these kids. You know, they get out of the car, you put them on the ground, and they just take off like 50 miles an hour. And they go running into stuff, and they bang their head, and they fall down, and they get back up, and they just keep running, and, and they just don't stop. And you think to yourself, you, you got to nail this kid's foot to the floor because he just is so full of energy. Well, we had one of these kids in the nursery, and he's running around, he's doing his thing, he's climbing on this and that, and, you know, and, and I'm wiped out. I need a nap after 30 minutes of this kid, you know? And, and it's getting co closer to the end of the time of the nursery. I'm looking at my watch, I'm like, oh, where's his parents, you know? And, uh, you know, thinking, thinking to myself, you know, this, this kid is just, you know, he, he is just, you know, too much. And I see him run across the nursery, and his shoes are untied. And I'm like, buddy, come back. You know, I chase you, you got to tie your shoe. We got to get your shoes tied because you're going to fall and, and smack your nose. Not, not that, you know, he's, he fell like 2,500 times, but I didn't want him to get hurt, okay? And, and so I, I go after him. He looks at me and he says, Mister, I don't know how to tie my shoes. You do it. <laughs> and he comes over and he puts that foot right on my, my, my lap <laughs> and he wants me to tie his shoes. That's humility. There's no shame there. There's no pride. That kid saw himself in a more accurate light than most adults see themselves because he saw he had a need and he knew he couldn't fix it. And he found somebody who could. That's the gospel. We have a need. It's a deep one. We're separated from a holy God because of our sin. We fall short of his glory every single day. We have a problem and we can't fix it. And that's why Jesus came. And Jesus died. And Jesus rose three days later from a grave to prove to the world that his sacrifice was perfect, holy, pleasing, and acceptable in the sight of a holy God. And he extends to us grace and mercy and a free pardon and forgiveness, but we need to come like a little child. Because if you think you're going to fix this mess on your own, it's never going to happen. I hear all the time people saying to me, well, you know, I'm going to clean up my act and then I'm going to come to church. You'll never be in church. You come to church because we're dirty and struggling and our shoes are untied and we're falling down and we're bumping our noses and we're colliding with other people and we're making a mess out of it. That's why we come here. To discover Christ. To grow in our relationship with Christ. To develop intimacy with Christ because we can't do it on our own and we need one another and most importantly we need Him. And this is what we find here in the story of Noah. A man who is exceptionally humble. And God is inviting each one of us in this room this morning into a relationship with himself. And the question is, will you respond? Or will we be like so many times before 
when you get that party invitation or that wedding invite or that shower invite or that invite to the graduation or the bar mitzvah or the bat mitzvah, you know, whatever the case may be. And, and, and we just look at it and we just chuck it by the side and it ends up in some pile. And then you realize six months later you never got back to the person. This morning I want to extend an invitation. And I hope and pray you respond. It's a twofold invitation to know Christ and to grow in Christ. To enter into a relationship with the God of the universe who loves you, who cares for you, who died for you, and who rose three days later from a grave so that we could find forgiveness in Him. And if you're not sure where you stand with God, if you've never been born again, if you've never placed your faith in Him and Him alone. You know, so many times I hear people say, well, yeah, I believe in Jesus, but I'm still working on it. That's not saving faith. That's seeing Jesus as some sort of a key, and He, he opens the door, and I've got to do something to walk through it. I've got to be a good person. I've got to follow a bunch of rituals, sacraments, you know, stuff. That, that, that's not how we get saved. I love the hymn, In Christ Alone My Hope is Found. Because unless he washes you or me, we have no part with him. He's doing the work on our behalf. And we've got to be little children and receive that gift. I was going to ask and offer you a challenge this morning. If you can look through your Bible and ever find a reference where God refers to his followers as adults. We're going to spend a lifetime looking. <laughs> so rather than sending you down a rabbit trail you'll never come back on, I'll give you the shortcut. It never happens. The only type of reference God makes to his followers is children. So if you are not sure where you stand with God this morning and you would like to become his child, I'm going to extend the invitation to you to receive him as your savior. Trust in him, following him, turn to him, and receive him today. The second part of my invitation is to those of you who do know him, but there's a part of your life, there's an element there whereby you have not surrendered. Jesus is not just our Savior, he is our Lord. And we are called to follow him as Lord. He is fully God and he deserves our allegiance our trust, and our commitment. And so often in this world, we have folk running around, and oh yeah, I believe in Christ, and, and, and they're, they're sincere, I, I, they're Christians. But there is something in the way. And we throw up these roadblocks, and we choose to, to hang on to a part of our life, and not allow him to be Lord of all. And this morning, if there is an element of your life that needs to be surrendered to him, he is inviting us to holiness and to commitment and to serving. And I want to invite you to let go of that element and proclaim him Lord of all. And I ask everyone to close their eyes and bow their heads. And this morning, if... Uh, if you're not sure where you stand with God, if you've never been born again, if you've never received Christ as your Savior, and you're sitting there in that pew and you know the storm is coming, you know that God loves you, and perhaps you've been resisting for a long time. And this morning I pray that you'd open your heart, your mind, and your soul to the good news that Jesus loves you and he will rescue you right now and extend forgiveness and reconciliation if you'd receive him as your savior. You could do so by joining me very quietly right there in the pew and praying with me and acknowledging your sin, acknowledging your need, and acknowledging that Christ is the cure. I'll lead out in a prayer, and if you would like to join with me 
and receive Christ and trust in Christ, and make a decision to follow Christ, then right there in the recess of your soul and your heart, join with me as we pray together. Lord Jesus, I know I've sinned, and I've made many mistakes with my life. And this morning, I realize I cannot fix my problem. But only you can wash away my sin and give to me forgiveness and restoration. I receive you now in faith as my Savior and trust in you and you alone to wash away my sin. Please help me from this day forward to follow you.